In the not-so-wonderful world of high-end game collecting, every console is a little bit different. The Atari VCS has droves of extremely rare regional games that lapse in and out of existence for 20 years at a time, the NES has a smattering of late-release title games that all command insane amounts of money, the GameCube begrudgingly has dirt common games that command insane amounts of money, but even with all this variety, one common throughline exists. There is always one certain game that stands out above the rest. A holy grail with ridiculously low supply and even more ridiculous demand. To that end, a lot of holy grail games make sense to some extent. It's easy to see why it might be rare, and it's also understandable why people would desperately want a copy. The NES has a little Samson, because it was a late release from a small development studio that still managed to push the system to new heights, heights that by 1992 people were already intimately familiar with, the SNES has Hagane for many of the same reasons, only with the added benefit of a provably incorrect rumor mill that it was a blockbuster exclusive, the Saturn has Panzer Dragoon Saga because it was an established franchise with innovative gameplay, a troubled development cycle, four discs, and a staggered release as one of the last games for the system, insert 20-page essay here. No matter the console, there is always a concise story about why these games are the way they are. That is, except for maybe one. The Mega Drive. There are a ton of games on the Mega Drive that consistently sell for over $50, but conspicuously, all but two of them drop off the map as soon as the price crawls above $100. Of those two, Musha and Crusader of Senti have traded places as the most expensive Mega Drive game for the past six or seven years. Taken from someone who can afford rent by buying and selling retro video games, there is no other library in existence with that kind of trend. Not only do video games almost never drop off in return with that kind of spike in value, they also almost never have an upper bound of less than $300. Crusader of Senti definitely falls under a lot of the same trappings that most Holy Grail games are all too familiar with, but Musha is unique. There exist very few good sources why this random game out of 700 plus could be the one to reach such a status. It can't be explained away with the usual late release equals low print logic, and it covers a genre that the Mega Drive is famous for. From my perspective, it's always been a fascinating exception to a rule that I have always known as an accepted norm. I'm much more experienced now than I was when I first got into game collecting, and after building a Mega Drive collection of my own, spanning nearly 100 games, I think I can finally put this mystery to rest. Out of more than 40 shooters, what's so special about Musha? How rare is Musha, and above all else, why has it ascended as a holy grail? In the early days of the Mega Drive, Sega wanted nothing short of top-notch content. After all, it's tough to convince NES kids to buy a brand new system if the generational leap is anything short of jaw-dropping. First-party titles would need to consistently push boundaries, most notably with celebrity endorsements, and third-party titles would need to reflect a similar high standard. This model is very familiar with what Nintendo had when the NES went nationwide in 1986, only in their case they had a very different philosophy. In an attempt to curate the NES from the shovelware that had previously crashed the industry, Nintendo dipped into the production of every single NES game. They manufactured every game without compromise, and as quote-unquote payments, they were charged 2,000 yen for every cartridge produced, usually around double of what it actually costed. Adjusting that number for inflation and converting it to Freedom Land, that's nearly a $23 expense right out of the gate. They also famously never allowed religious symbolism or other objectionable content, such as the word death, in order to Disneyfy the console's image. Furthermore, the minimum production run for an NES game was 10,000 units. To put it simply, it was a gross money sink with minimal profit margins, but Nintendo was a monopoly, so it became the standard. Sega followed suit, enforcing every third party to use their brand of cartridges, and they also charged similar but slightly lower fees. For all of my research, I still haven't been able to pinpoint what exactly the royalty fees were, but programmer Kevin Segetti claimed in an interview with GDRI that the average cartridge costed about $17 for third-party publishers. Unlike Nintendo, there were eventually exceptions made about this on a case-by-case -case basis, most famously with EA and Accolade, but that's the story that 99% of third-party publishers had. With that said, Sega was not about the lifestyle of Disney-fying their machine. They needed to stand out by appealing to the older and more seasoned gamer. So they allowed third parties much more creative freedom. The Mega Drive did have some off-limit parameters. That's important to remember, but they were so vaguely defined that in an era before games had ratings, Sega let third parties use their common sense without any trouble. For example, don't make porn, don't make it racist, and respect copyright were among the only binding rules. Although this very official document also interestingly discourages games, quote, which make an overt political statement, unquote, Take that, libtards. This no-held-bars attitude is what drives the legend of the system today, but it's not without its asterisks. Seeing as how creative freedom could easily just mean obtuse garbage in the hands of untalented developers, there was still one giant hurdle that kept quality assurance. In North America, the minimum production run for a Mega Drive game was 30,000 copies. Sega liked money 
and with less than 10% of the North American markets, this is how they got it. It's a win-win scenario for them. Compared to the NES, the Mega Drive had cheaper cartridges with fewer ROM chips and way less plastic, and they charged about the same amount for them. At the same time, while an NES third party could request 10,000 copies of a game, a Mega Drive third party could only request three times that amount or more, and by extension give Sega more than three times the royalty fees. It was guaranteed money! And because smaller upstart companies would have no chance of ever turning a profit with that kind of investment, at least not without a very confident risk, the result for consumers was a highly curated library that they could almost always buy from in good faith. Their lax policy on what was allowed for release did let some fresh and innovative titles adorn the Mega Drive's 1990 lineup, but it also led to a very noticeable trend of developers front-running an already existing tried-and-true genre. One which just so happened to lend itself to the Mega Drive's razor-sharp 68,000 CPU perfectly. In 1990, the Mega Drive's holiday lineup was literally about 33% shooter, all of which were third-party. Many of them released to rave reviews, especially Thunder Force 3. Right alongside Strider, Castle of Illusion, and John Madden Football, it found itself positioned as a killer app for the holiday season. Fire Shark, Felios, and Hellfire were also quite well regarded. With that said, given that so many games were being released in such a short period of time on a single otherwise small machine, critics and major publications of the time slowly began to lament the sheer volume of shooters being released. After all, in the eyes of the uninformed, primordial public, there's only so much wiggle room to innovate in a genre specifically about shooting and dodging bullets. For a console that was desperately trying to stand out at the time, the wave of shooters was slowly getting tired. So passed Battle Squadron and Sector X, Whip Rush, Hellfire, Arrow Flash, and Granada without much fanfare, all within the 1990 holiday season. As such, when this random game called Musha came out in early 1991, nobody paid attention to it. It was the gazillion shooter in a very saturated market, and it didn't even have the advent of the Christmas season to back it up. Keeping in mind that the Mega Drive is still being crushed by the NES at the time, and its install base in North America was still only at about 1.4 million units. Of the people who even knew any details about Musha, the game was often criticized at launch for being way too easy. That sounds outlandish today, but in the age of video game rentals and harsh limitations, games needed longevity somehow as such, Harder Equals Better was basically an unsung law before the industry began craving multi-disc RPGs. Musha was sold to a limited audience, and of that crowd, almost everyone was simply apathetic about it. Above all else, however, there's good reason to believe that the publishers themselves were apathetic about it. To understand Musha is to first understand the people who brought it to the US, Seismic Software Incorporated. They were one of many Western publishers who sprung up in the early days of the fourth generation, but they're set apart by just how early they were. For one, they were actually one of only three licensees for the Master System in the US, publishing RC Grand Prix in July 1990 to very little fanfare. They were also literally the first independent third-party licensee for the Mega Drive in America, publishing Air Diver and Super Highline in April 1990. Yes, by the way, the Mega Drive literally spent its first eight months without a single licensee, and the first company they got gave them Super Highline. I love this stupid console. Clearly, they were a very niche company, probably too small for the Mega Drive by all means, and it certainly didn't help that their first game was a critically panned RPG which needed an expensive battery backup. In fact, Super Highlight was literally the second game in the entire console generation to make use of a battery backup after Phantasy Star 2. Comparing those two titles, it's easy to postulate why the game is so notorious. Tellingly, the release of Musha marked the last commercial appearance of the name Seismic Software Incorporated anywhere, much less in the high-end, risky business of game publishing. Trust me, I looked. Their only other release was the aforementioned Hellfire, which came out in the holiday season of 1990, and from there, they faded out of existence. The game received practically no budget for advertising. After this ad for Hellfire was consistently thrown into all of the era's major magazines in late 1990, Musha had no such treatment in 1991. They would still need to put the time and money into remodeling the box art, however, because there's no way that a video game could advertise having a strong female protagonist. This print ad apparently circulated for a while, but even after spending an entire day of searching through magazine scans, I have yet to find an instance of it. Nevertheless, a handful of magazines still published about Musha. Tellingly, more than half of them were European, despite the fact that Musha never got released in Europe. A quintessential example of what I like to call the Nintendo Power Effect. The April 1991 issue of Powerplay magazine, a German publication, had presumably nice things to say about it. In England, however, critics were a little more on the nose. The May 1991 issue of Ray's magazine begins its tiny blurb about Musha with a very poignant quote. What is it with the Mega Drive? I've had a good look through the machine's manuals and nowhere does it say, we promise to produce 100 shoot-em-ups in the first year. But that's the way it's looking each month. 
The review goes on to compare Musha with Total Plan's Truxton, which hurts me more than you know. The May 1991 issue of Computer and Video Games is even more scathing about how derivative Musha seemed at first. The whole magazine is also written by the scuffiest outskirts on the left side of the road, so bear with me. Musha is yet another vertically scrolling shoot 'em up. Why are there so many of the flipping things on the Mega Drive? The game isn't very challenging at all. Anyone who's at least half decent at shoot 'em ups will be able to beat Musha in less than an hour. Although you have a nice amount of control over your extra weapons, even at full power, they aren't half as impressive as, say, Truxton's <laughs> On the other side of the pond, only a few reviews exist. GamePro allocated a mind-blowing nine sentences to it in their March 1991 issue, with such thoughtful observations as, Musha is a one-player vertically scrolling shoot 'em up and destroy enemies and grab different colored capsules to power up your rep dash ons. Dr. Dave seemingly likes the game? On the same exact page where he liked Gyrus even more, but his total lack of insight is telling through omission. Plus, in the context of GamePro, it's worth noting that in the very next issue, they gave a higher rating to Bart vs. the Space Mutants. When every game is a 10 out of 10, none of them are. The only glimmer of high praise that Musha got upon its release was being awarded Mega Drive Game of the Month by Chris Slate in the April 1991 issue of Game Players Magazine. For the record, that month would still be the month of March when considering the production time and publishing of a monthly outlet. It won out against such fierce competition as literally just Crackdown and that's it, but that's not to say that Slate didn't have genuinely nice things to say about Musha. It's given a full, five-page spread and a slot on their top 100 list. He went on record with some pretty bold statements. It reads, Musha has some of the fastest action ever seen in a shooter. You're constantly smothered in wave after wave of enemy ships while flying over some of the most beautifully illustrated graphics to ever appear in a Mega Drive game. Musha is an arcade shooter that might not achieve anything new, but it does everything right. It's worth noting that this review also decides to omit the comparison to Truxton. This was no doubt how Musha found its original fans, but although these words were certainly nice, they were still written for Game Players Magazine. Its reach was still a far cry from any of the big three publications, so we've basically arrived at the same problem where we started. With the utter lack of print ads and good publicity, no one beyond the hardest of the hardcore Mega Drive fans even knew that Musha existed, and of those who did, many of them probably cashed out on their shooter fill long before the game's release. This is all speculative reasoning, of course, and it is worth noting that Musha at least didn't bomb hard enough for Tangan to reconsider localizing robo on the Mega CD more than two years later with a notable advertising push. Whatever the case may be, however, it certainly wasn't successful enough to keep Seismic from going out of business. With that, are the quantities actually limited enough in the aftermarket for us to assume that the minimum print run of 30,000 copies was ordered? I'd say there's a good chance of it. If nothing else, we certainly know that the game was never printed more than once. Searching for this game on eBay at any given time will yield plenty of copies, but when talking about holy grails, that representation is always a little skewed. While we're here, though, there's no better place to study a wide variety of copies. From here, not only does every single copy look the exact same, every single PCB is also the exact same. The 4 megabit ROM chip powering Musha has a burn date of 9048, aka the 48th week of 1990, aka early December 1990. The fact that every cartridge has this burn date is significant. If you take a look at a random common game from around the same time and compare its PCB with scans online, the burn dates will have a good chance of not matching up. Given what we generally know about how cartridges were made, this tells us a few things. The chipping and shipping of cartridges at the time was generally around 1-3 to three months, so unless the turnaround was exceptionally quick, the game almost certainly came out in early 1991. This is backed up by the fact that the aforementioned March 1991 issue of GamePro Magazine claims a spring 1991 release window. Let's not mince words though, release dates before the N64 practically did not exist. Games quote-unquote released whenever the shipment arrived, so it's best to give it a grain of salt. The game almost certainly sold in the 30,000 unit range, but that's not to say that its rarity contributes to its legacy. Keep this in mind. 1990 was the best year for the NES. Even against a mounting lineup of games on the Mega Drive, the NES was still absolutely slaughtering it. In 1990 alone, NES sales went up 27% from 1989 to the tune of 7.2 million units. Even though Sega of America controlled about 75% of the fourth generation market, Nintendo of America controlled about 87% of the overall video game market when Musha released to the public. And we know this because they bragged about it at the winter 1991 CES. John Madden Football was considered a crucial killer app for the system, and it sold 400,000 copies. Technocop was the fifth highest selling Mega Drive game of the 1990 holiday season, and it sold 50,000 copies. 
Have you even heard of Technocop? With that context in mind, I have a hard time believing that ordering 30,000 copies of a game was not a common practice. This is backed up by circumstantial evidence as well. Ask anyone who has a complete American Mega Drive collection and they will all give you a different list of the final games they needed. G to the next level needed Dune 2, Batman Returns, and The Incredible Hulk. Not Musha. Retro Sunday needed Pack Attack, Rings of Power, and Vapor Trail. Not Musha. Other obscure early games like Atomic Robo Kid, Crossfire, Shove It, and Bimini Run were almost certainly all games that were as limited as Musha, and it partially explains why there are so many games on the system that are in the $40 to $100 range. So what about Musha stands out from the crowd? Three months after Musha's release, Sonic the Hedgehog would debut to widespread critical acclaim. Six months later, thanks to the Mega Drive's price being dropped and finally getting stocked in Walmart, it would reach 3 million units. All the while, Musha would be forgotten as a relic of a bygone era. That is, until the early to mid-2000s, when the coinciding phenomenon of the PlayStation 2 and horrific death of the Dreamcast made games more expensive and mainstream than ever before. In this climate, shooters became a critically endangered genre. Hardcore fans of shooters looked outward for content instead of inward, and they would eventually make up the market for some of the earliest trends in game collecting. Radiant Silvergun was heavily imported despite only 50,000 copies being produced, and as such, it made for one of the first expensive games in what would eventually become the aftermarket. Ikaruga on the Dreamcast was imported at such an alarming rate that infograms directly responded by localizing it for release on the GameCube. Shooters were so well loved by the needlessly devout Dreamcast community that they were literally the only games keeping the defunct system on life support from late 2004 to 2007. When the Sega Dreamcast finally, finally bit the dust, the Dreamcast community made their own shooters, culminating in the ambitious release of Stormwind in 2013. From this, I can gleam a few things, but the presiding observation is that Sega fans really like shooters, and as of this point in time, they would need to start looking back to satisfy their itch. What they found was a torrent of Mega Drive games that, coincidentally, all got released around the same time. They also aided in rediscovering the TurboGrafx-16 after the new Wii's Virtual Console featured it in 2006, and proceeded to completely screw over the prices for the rest of our lives. Of the games they found, however, none ironically stood out more than Musha. Musha is bold. That's the first and best adjective that comes to mind when describing it. After all, very few games can say they're consistently stylized with an all-caps title. Its sharp, contrasting visual elements are bold. Its distinctly outrageous and overzealous music is bold, it doesn't care what you think about it, and its daring, unique box art brings attention to itself in any collection. Musha simply plays by its own rules, and it demands you to follow along. Speaking from experience, retro game collectors of any breed will eat that kind of attitude up. But no one loves a rebellious game quite like Sega fans. With any one of these factors alone, Musha would not be what it is today. I want to make that abundantly clear. The only reason we even know about Sega's minimum production run policy is because it's cited by Razorsoft employees as a reason why they published Stormlord without a license in July 1991. As such, Stormlord is objectively rarer than Musha, yet because Stormlord isn't Musha, you can buy it for less than $20. You can also buy Hellfire for about $30, Fire Shark for about $25, and even the critically acclaimed Thunder Force 3 for about $45. However, because it is all of these factors wrapped into a single, highly uncommon game, you cannot buy Musha for $45, and you have not been able to for 15 years. Here's a Usenet post from 2003 mentioning how expensive it was. The Fall 2004 issue of Video Game Collector Magazine estimates Musha to have a complete box value of around $40. Keep in mind this is back when Hagane on the NES was worth about $25 complete in box. The earliest recorded archives on price charting estimated it to have a value of $30 to $40 loose in 2007, and after Classic Game Room began consistently spreading the good word of Musha in spring 2008, the game has never stopped climbing in value. Usha will cost you more than buying a brand new game for the Xbox 360 or PS3. In fact, Musha's legend grew so much in the late 2000s that the game would eventually be re-released by Sega themselves on the Wii's Virtual Console, God rest its soul, a treatment not given to any of its contemporaries that so firmly locked it out of the markets in 1991. That is where Musha stands today. One of the Mega Drive's most defining games in the pre-Sonic the Hedgehog era, Musha is still unrivaled and unparalleled in so many ways. 
Its unique blend of cyberpunk, feudal anime aesthetics, tight gameplay, and unrestrained music all come together to form one of the most Sega does what Nintendo don't games in existence. Just like the console itself, it can still fail to strike the right chord if you don't know what you're looking at. After all, if Musha and its console were supposed to be scrappy rebellions against the mainstream of their day, it's hard to imagine the game being significant to any more than a handful of passionate collectors 30 years later. For all of its hardships, however, Musha is a truly special game. One that I've wanted to own personally for countless years, not because of its value, but in spite of its value. Game collecting sucks. I'll see you later. Happy New Year! 1991, I know you guys are all watching this at 1996 right now. And in the early 1990s, this is what was the main attraction. Nintendo, the Genesis. That was the most, well, that was the most popular, well not popular, or well, somehow kind of popular, huh Gil? And the most powerful game right now on the market, except for this other one called Turbo Graphics.